Augustus. Father Lord, we have a little time to be close upon you. You are the ancient of David, the repentant of the Messiah's prayer. The God that answers prayer. Unto you shall every God be perfect. Lord, I need this opportunity to exalt and to help you. For giving us hope in this land. Father Lord, my God, many sights to see today, but we cannot say. But we see it and we are glad. Today we take the opportunity to make the people of God. Lord, direct our sister, guide us with wisdom. Teach us knowledge and understanding. Prepare our mind with the help of your Holy Spirit. The grace that is needed to assimilate what you are about to teach us today. Holy Spirit, guide us with wisdom and understanding. For no man can understand the things of God and send the spirit of God at the We know as our spirit is there with us with your strength and mind. We know the things that are fully given from God. For the Lord, as many that will come to this program, expect to receive from you who will never be disappointed. As many that are sick, let them be healed. As many that are in bondage, let them be free. As many that are saved in the valley of the shadow of death, let the great light of God shine upon their life. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, tonight we have another wonderful, exciting topic for you. We bless the name of the Lord for giving us hope and the fortitude to see another week. What shall I say? If God be for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his only son, Jesus Christ, but he gave it as an atonement for us. We know through Jesus, he will give us everything we desire in life, including the benefit of this world. Lord, that's why this evening we use opportunity to exalt and to honor your name. To thank you in the midst of the church, for there is none holy as the Lord our God. There is none beside him. Neither is there any rock like our rock. Our God is a trusted hope in times of trouble. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Today we have another exciting topic. The title is The Call of God. The Call of God. Today we want to exploit it. Because there are so many Christians today who feel that the call of God is only in the biblical time, in the time of Elijah, Elijah and so on. That it's not possible for God to call someone today in the church. But we are quite sure throughout the New Testament, people were caught of God. And they heard the voice of God. And so we're going to be exploiting the pattern today. Of hearing from God, having God direct us on the path that we should choose and how to best obey His call or serve His purpose in our ministerial life. Today, the person to teach you this thing is somebody who has experienced this call himself, who grew by it. I was taught, guided by the vision he received as a child. And the same call prompted him and led him to the mission. Why I am not here to tell you my story, but I want you to be rest assured that whatever you hear from this lesson today are eyewitness accounts. The teachings does not only correspond with the scriptures, but they are eyewitness accounts. And the person teaching you tonight is an eyewitness of the majesty of God, his call, his vision, his direction. And that's why tonight you will have an exciting time. Because the topic, I have made a vow a long time in the ministry not to teach on any topic that I have not personally experienced. And that's why tonight I am qualified to teach you this topic. Because I have not only personally experienced this teaching, but I have also 
a witness to God's call and God's direction in the life of the saints. The Lord called those he chose. The Lord indeed is still calling people today. But it's the call of God. We're going to explain the dimension of God's call. How he enforces our Christian faith and our belief. And we're going to also be exploiting the parts of the call of God. How the call of God is not the final decision in ministerial quality, but rather the training. So those are the parts we're going to be explaining today. Throughout this teaching, I will be giving you an example of the call of God and how they apply to our ministerial duties. God bless you as you follow. My name is Missionary Collins, the man who has served in the field of mission with the direction of God and left all behind for the sake of the gospel and have worked in the field now for more than 10 years and qualified enough to be able to tell you about God's call, God's direction and God's instruction. God bless you as you participate in this lecture. Our steps today will be taken from the book of 1 Samuel chapter 3 and Romans chapter 12 verse 1. 1 Samuel chapter 3, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Before we read, I want you to take opportunity to understand, is God called real? Is it just our imagination? Is it some kind of vision we have in our sleep? I could tell you as a man who has experienced the call, it's not a vision. Neither some kind of sleep dream. You hear God call, you don't see His call. The call of God is heard verbally, just like any other man speaking with you. And His directions leave a lasting imprint that you cannot erase from generation to come. God cannot call you in the night and you wake up in the morning and you forget. It doesn't exist. That is not God calling. When God called you, the voice of God sticks. Moses was right when he said the voice of the Lord shake the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord shake the mind. It brings a kind of inner peace that no man on earth, living or dead, can explain. And this call are Vaba and they are real. So, like in our principle, let's go straight into the scriptures and take a clue from an example. Take a clue from a man who God has called before and who have heard this call and the direction and how the call came to pass in his lifetime. The name of this person we'll be exploring in this topic is Samuel. Samuel in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, from verse 3, he said, The boy Samuel was serving God under Eli's direction. He was at a time when the revelation of God was read and heard or seen. At the time of Samuel, there were not many prophets and no many visions or revelation. The revelation of God was rare. In fact, a whole nation gathered together to listen to the vision and revelation of God for direction. That was the time which Samuel was born. Samuel, we know who Samuel was. Samuel was a promised child to Anna when he asked him of the Lord. And he cried unto the Lord without even uttering a voice, pouring the spirit before the Lord. In response, the Lord gave her a child. And Anna fulfilled his promise to God by returning that child back to God as she has promised. And returning the child to God, the child said before earlier in Shiloh, 
When Anna returned the child to God, and the child was lent to God for the rest of his life, neither the child nor his mother know the direction that God had chosen for the child. But she fulfilled her own part of the bargain. But because God who foresees and foreknew, knew that Hannah would obey the voice of the Lord, he deposited a gift in Samuel. Something unique to him. And this gift was unknown to either Samuel or the mother or even Eli, the prophet. But the child was blessed to the Lord. Eli found himself raising a little boy who he doesn't know what God has in stuff, anything for the child. Until one day, God called out, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Yes, I am here. Then he ran unto Eli. So this point, why do we read it? I want to use it in this verse 4 to 5 to point to you something here. That the voice of God, you hear it audibly. In the fact, in the case of Samuel, it was so clear that Samuel thought it was Eli that was calling. And he ran to Eli. The voice of God is not a trash or some mirage. If not, Samuel would not have woke up from a trance and ran to Eli. It was reality. So because God they present to you today as some kind of distant figure who can neither speak nor hear. No. But the God we serve can speak. He can be indulged in the combat. We saw an example of that in the book of Joshua. A man that had his sword drawn towards Jericho. And Joshua said, are you with us or with our adversary? The man says, I am the captain of the Lord God of hosts. So we knew he is not a God that is far away. He is a God that is at hand. A God that can hear our prayer is capable of speaking to us. The God that can answer us when we call can also reply us when we need an answer. The God that can direct our footsteps can also guide us when we are going astray. And that is the God we are talking about tonight. Why is this teaching important for a leader? This teaching is important for a leader because he that comes to God must believe first that God is God. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. If you don't believe God is God, you have no business listening to this message. And you don't have any business even attending church on Sunday or any religious activity for whatsoever reason. The only reason why you go to church every Sunday or celebrate with the rest of the saints is that in your heart you believe that God is God and that he somehow is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. But God is not around today and we cannot see him. We cannot hold him. How do we not believe in something we do not see? Something we cannot touch or handle? That's where faith comes in. As in the physical, we have gravity, which you cannot touch, you cannot handle, you cannot see, but it's a means of transportation. That's why today we have a popular philosophy. Though no eyes have seen gravity, that what goes up must surely come down. So in the spirit realm, we have another philosophy of faith. Faith is the means of transportation in the spirit realm. Because there is spiritual forces that pull your prayer, that pull your walk whenever you pray. I am not saying this from some books. 
I have a personal experience of these visions and this agent. And they head down your prayers, preventing it from moving forward. But this is not because God is weak. He allows the devil to take over your prayer or to mislead you. No. The reason is the day you open your mouth as a believer and pray in faith, God heard you. And in that moment of time, he has also delivered a reply. But how do you get this reply? Because most of us has left all our life without even hearing a single word from God. Or even understanding what he is about to say to us. Now we are talking about reply. If you cannot hear from somebody, how do you get his reply? And that is where faith comes in. Because the Bible says, The just shall live by faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. If you come to God, you must first believe that He is God. That is where the journey of hearing from God starts. You cannot hear from somebody you don't believe exists. Neither can you even listen to a teacher in your institution if you don't believe that the teacher can teach you anything meaningful that will help you academically. So without you having confidence in God, you will not listen to God. You will not listen to the spirit of truth which he has sent into the world. And if you do not listen to those two, your ministry is like living in a river without water. So that is how it ends. Because God is the strength of the believer. Without faith, we cannot even be freed from sin. Because if you don't believe in God, you have already committed sin. You have broken one of the first commandments. That says that your Lord, your God is one. The Lord, your God is one. And you must put your singleness of heart in him. And if you don't believe he is God and that he is one, that is all. Your Christian faith is foundation is zero. It's built on nothing, absolutely nothing. That's why this evening, I want to take opportunity to explain the details to you why the call of God is essential in the life of a believer. Because the call of God is not meant to give you the textbook assignment needed for the project. No. God is a God that calls those things that are not as though they are and they come to be. The call of God is not detailed. God never called any man in a dream or vision or in a revelation or direct voice. And gave him detailed assignment. Now, he gave you a word. Like he said to Moses, I am sending you to rescue my people from Egypt. He never told Moses how to deal with the stiff necked people, how to gather the elder of Israel together, until Moses began to ask for that question. The same thing with the call of God. If you don't understand, ask no question. He is not a tyrant who doesn't want to be asked any question. If you do not understand what he's telling you, go back to him in prayer. Seek for guidance and direction. When I was called into the ministry about 20 something years ago, I never understand what the call was. In fact, the last thing in my life I wanted to be was to be a minister. I have my own visions, I have my plans, and I've been working towards it vigorously, before and after the call. 
And when God showed me a direction to choose for him, I only asked him a simple question. How do I find these people? You told me to find the people that are on earth. And all I can see from the vision you showed me is only my face. I can't even see the people. How do I begin to find people that I cannot see? That was all I asked. And the answer of that question did not come immediately. Like in the case of Moses. In my case, it took many years. Because God called me as a child. He waited for me to grow up. Before he showed me the direction. And teach me how to find them out. His answer did not come say, you will go to Lagos. You will go to Abuja. And you will go to so and so place. And find the people that I told you to find. No. His answer came in form of a plan. First, he teach me salvation by exposing to me the story of a king who has his son banished because of his wife. But after that, the son forgave them. And the king forgave the son despite his plotted revenge against him and said it would be my son and even shaded him from the recompense of his sin from the authorities god used that to teach me what forgiveness mean to him god goes further to teach me the scriptures by teaching me the man who the scripture was about jesus christ he go beyond that to teach me the path of faith that without faith it is impossible to please god that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not said. He went further to teach me faith, love. After I have grown in the spirit, strong enough to focus on the vision he taught me, he came again and taught me the path of love. Because he showed me that love would work as a child of God, I should strive for. And I should not strive for power, for wealth, for glory, but I should strive for love. That teachings began the foundation until he finally revealed to me that I was called into a mission. By showing me in the revelation that I was a missionary in this work is where my life began and end. That's why throughout my lifetime, I can compromise every other studies, every other career, but not be called to mission. And this is exactly why did I give you this detail? Because many Christians today do not understand God's call and the format. But now, somebody said, he told you to find out the people on earth. What does those teachings you just said relate to this particular call? Because God knew for me to be able to find his people. First, I need to understand what the scripture says about those people. He taught me the word of God. He knew that I need to understand forgiveness. If I must have the heart to save the lost, he taught me forgiveness. He knew I need to love my enemies, love my friends, love my neighbor as I love myself if I must go forward in life. He taught me love by the aid of his angel on a Sunday service in the church, in assemblies of God. And he knew that I could not have attained to any of this journey except I have faith because many would not believe except they see sign. And science cannot come except you believe in the one that gives signs. He taught me faith 
to have confidence in him. Then he understood that without love, I cannot save a world of lost sinner. He taught me about love. The whole vision of the mission, even at these teachings, were not yet made manifest until he called me and said, you are a missionary. This is the work you begin and where your life ends. Every other thing is a distraction. That was when I understand that I was not matured enough to be sent out. So the call of God is not once. It follows a process. And that is exactly what Samuel soon discovered in his life. Samuel, the Lord called him. But in the case of Samuel, God showed him the man he was about to take over from. And the reason why. Just as it happened in my case. The case of Samuel was antagonist to my case. That's why I like using the book of Samuel as a reference in this teaching. Because before God called you to replace somebody, he is not just going to speak and said, Oh, I saw this man leave his place of glory and he come down without telling you the offense and the sins of that man. God told him clearly, not Eli. Eli was a righteous man. He was just and a perfect man before God. But his sons, his sons get ruling. They abuse the sacrifice of God. And they make wantons of the offerings that were given to God. As a result, these things displease the Lord. And the Lord proposed in his heart that he was going to punish Eli. He first of all said, Samuel was not the first prophet sent to Eli. God sent a prophet to tell one the house of Eli that if they do not desist from their evil, he is going to visit their works with an act of judgment. God's laws does not punish a man without first giving him a hearing. Now, that's why today you still have Christians, despite the sins of the world. Some pastor even prophesy that God, if God does not visit this earth, that he will apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. But yet, the sins multiply on daily basis. And people think maybe God is sleeping, or God is dead, or God doesn't exist anymore. That's why sin can multiply and he keep quiet. No. Just like in the case of Eli, he waited for their talk to be free. And he waited for their sin and their iniquity to be right. The same thing God always waits. Because God is long suffering. God is patient. And he waited for the right heart. The ministry of God does not count your age. I was called at the age of eight. But my ministry did not begin until I was about 30 years old. That showed you the period he wanted me to wait and be trained by him. Was I dormant all those years? No. He subjects me to strict training. Just like in the case of Jesus. Jesus was born at a very tender age. At the age of 12, he prophesied in the temple. And after that, he remained capital until he was 33 and a half years before God commissioned him for mission. Don't, don't be those who before God speaks, they run. While the voice have not yet come, they say, here I am, only to abandon the work halfway because they were not properly groomed for the battle ahead. Christians who has not matured in the things of God will flee in the face of adversity. And that's why as a Christian, you must first and foremost be taught in the things of God. How do we get taught in the things of God? God called out to Samuel 
in verse in chapter 4, 3, verse 4. Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel asked her, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli. That's telling you he was very young. God was patient. He did not say you were very young. I called once, you ran to Eli. I will not call again. He went back to sleep again to his bed because Eli said that he did not call him. And the Lord came again and said, Samuel, Samuel. And he went up again and ran to Eli. Because the only person he was aware of that could call him was Eli. And when he ran to him and he said, Here I am. Son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. This happened before Sam knew God for himself. He never knew who God was. Many of us were not privileged to be born in a religious home that everybody be a Christian. Because nobody in my home was ever a minister. I was not a pastor's son. I was not born in a Christian or religious home. Just as Eli, his mother was a good prayer warrior. Samuel was sent to Eli. It was in Eli's house he learned the principle of how to serve God or how to serve in the temple. But he has not knew God for himself. He was just a boy. But here is God calling for him. God who knew the heart and knew the thoughts. He knew the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. God called call can come at any point. But the first call you receive as a deliverer is not the call sending you into the ministry. It's the call of repentance. I remember when I received the call of repentance. I was with my friends on a Christmas watch night, celebrating, drinking, womanizing, committing all sorts of sin. But suddenly I was separated. And I saw a man being flogged and beaten. And after the whole horrible sin, the man said, All this I did for you. What have you done for me? I left that meeting that night a changed person. But today, I don't consider that as a call to the ministry. I consider it as a call to salvation. God wanted me to leave that gathering because that was not the path he was chosen for me. I was going astray. It's only a fool that caused sin and judgment. No wise man caused sin and judgment. But then I caught sin and judgment because I was a fool. I was not wise. If I was wise, I should not have been in the garden of people that has no good intention towards me by 12 to 1 p.m. in the night. But I left those garden and I quit those garden. And since then, the Lord has been good. Christians must learn that when God called you, He is not calling you to remain the way you are. He didn't call you because you were better than the people around of you. Around you. He didn't call you because you are the most qualified person in the congregation. No. That was not the reason for the call. Remember your calling, brethren. Not many wise men after the flesh were called. Not many nobles we are called. But do you know what God does? He chose the foolish things of this world to confront the things that are wise. He chose the weak and defies things to confront the things that are mighty. That's how God called. God calling and relations are without repentance. Because if God knew you would not do the work, he would not call you in the first place. A lot of people run to God and say, God called me, I will send you. But God never called. Even when Jesus was ministering, many people ran to Jesus and said, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you went. 
He only replied that the fools have more, the bear have less. But yet the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. But to another he said, Come and follow me. The one that did not say, I want to follow you. The man said, First let me go and bury my father first. Because everyone that God is calling for, that has the mind to serve the Lord, they always have an excuse. In my case, I have an excuse. In the Dausa case, if he was called at that point in time, he has an excuse. Everybody that God called has an excuse. Because that excuse is part of human nature. It comes. But the one that are not called, before God speaks, they are on the feet. They may even see a vision that looks like call. They run. And three years later, they are out of the field. Because it was not the voice of God in the first place. The danger of such gainsaying is you can be in the wrong place that God did not call you into. And as a result, you begin to blame God for your lack of growth, your lack of prosperity, your lack of entrance. God can only bless the work in sanction. The work he does not sanction, he will not bless it. I have tried my life in several other things since I was called. Not many of them was ever blessed. But whenever I try my hand on anything related to what God called me into, it spread up like a speeding bow. But when I try my own personal thinking and my own personal imagination, they sink down the drain. Then I understand that if God does not send you on an error and you go for that error, whatever you get, you'll be it. Now, let's go to our teaching. Let's quit the story and return to the scripture. Come and follow me, Jesus said. In the book of Matthew chapter 4, verse 29, verse 19 to 20. Jesus said, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Once they left their nets and followed him. They left their nets and followed him. What? Call to what? Jesus called. The Father called. The prophet were called. The missionaries were called. The whole believers on earth were called. In fact, many were called. But God chose few. The first 11 chapter of Roma. Chapter 12 says something that after God's goodness and understanding people, Jewish and other like allies, then Paul said in Romans 12 that because of such mercy, we are called to what? Offer him our body as a living sacrifice. So the call of God is not a call to eat or to drink wine or to become rich or to drive fancy car. Those, those can be added, but they are not the purpose of the call. The call is for you to offer your body as a living sacrifice, unlike the dead offerings of the Old Testament. And this sacrifice before God must be holy and acceptable, which is your reasonable service. And that's why it is difficult for those that are called to quit their life of pleasure and run after this sacrifice of holiness because it's not easy to come back 
not to conform to the ways of the world, but to be renewed in our thinking by the word of God. Why? Because when we do this, then God promised that we will know and be approved in his will. We are called to know God's will. First of all, we discover that God's will for us is good. God is good. God is good. Why did I use that word? If you come to God, you must know that He is a good God. Knowing that God is good will solve a lot of problems many Christians struggle against. You, if you know that God is good, you know when you kneel down in prayer, He hears you. If you know that God is good, you know that he, you have replied to your petition. If you know that God is good, you know that He will not withhold good things from them that walk uprightly. And that He loves us and I wants the best for us. And for others as well. Later we find that his will is actually pleasing to us. Finally we realize that God is perfect. So we are to totally surrender to it. To him. And no longer want our own ways. In Romans chapter 12 Verse 2. Let's go to the book of Romans. We might still come back to the book of Samuel later. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. The book of Romans chapter 12. From verse 2. He said, So dear, Let's read from King James. King James Version, Roman 12, 2. Okay, I read. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God wants you to be renewed according to his standard. God wants you to be perfect as a believer because he, your God, is a perfect God. You were called to perfection. You were not called to foolishness. Called to see ourselves correctly. To determine who we really are as a Christian. I remember in one of my revelation, the Lord lets down a curtain from heaven just to quote to me a Bible verse which was present in the scripture. And he said, Thou art a royal priesthood, a choosing generation, a peculiar son of God, who should show forth the praise of God, who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. In time past, you were not a people, but now you are God's people. In time past, you have not obtained mercy, but now you have obtained mercy. God showed me this because he wants me to know who I am. He wants me to know that I am a royal priesthood, a prince unto our God, a king and a prince after the order of Melchizedek. That is what God wants me to know who I am. That my authority supersedes that of the earthly pain, prince. And it also makes me understand that the saints have authority to execute judgment. 
So when we know who we are in Christ, our authority and our effort and our faith and our ability to assess things is limitless. Not swell up with pride, see yourself as useless one, unworthy, yes, but equally of great value in the eyes of God. Roman 12 verse 3, called to find our place in God. Roman 12 verse 3, he said, for I say, though the grace given to me and to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according to as God has dealt to every man, the measure of faith. God wants us to think soberly. God does not want us to be puffed up with pride. But beyond that, God wants us to find our place in his kingdom. No one can serve God in isolation, doing his own things. We are part of one body, and that body is Christ, of whom Jesus is the head, and we are member of that same body. Many people want to be the mass, but can you imagine a huge mass? <laughs> Walking down the streets with only tiny, tiny legs and arms and hands, what a monster will it look like? So will you be as a Christian if you walk in isolation? You will not be a Christian, you will be a monster. Like gold. He will fit you into the body exactly where you should be. We all are God family. We need each other to survive. You need me and I need you. We need each other to survive. We need, the missions need aid. They need support. The church needs salvation. They need discipleship. And they need to send their members into the mission to help the work of God. The harvest is truly ripe, but the laborers indeed are too few. The Lord needs each of us in order to make the ministry function. The branch cannot bear fruit of themselves, except they abide in the vine. Neither can the vine, except he abide in the branches. God will prune you if you do not bear fruit, so that you will bear fruit. But we all are part of God's family. And we need each other to survive. No Christian can grow in isolation. Call to use our gift. God call us, each and every one of us, to use the gift that he has given us. God taught me a lot of things in my lifetime that even if I have the whole world as a resource, I can never be able to bring those visions to reality. But at a point in time, I asked God a question. Why are you teaching me all these things? Am I going to be all these things at the same time? He said, no. So that when people come into the feed and they are jobless, you teach them to do those things. That's why he said in the book of Habakkuk 2 2, write the vision, make it plain, write it on top of a table that it may run for many he who read it. If you read it, you will run with it. That is the purpose why God gives us vision. You were not called in isolation, you were not called because there is nobody else in the world. That you are the most qualified person for the job. No. In fact, the worst people are called. The weakest are called. The most lazy are called. Those who does not even qualify to stand 
because of their poor poverty are called into the ministry. God called the poor of this world to make them rich in faith. God called the weak to make them stronger. God called the foolish to make them wise. So your calling does not add failure to you. Your calling brings God out in you. God does not look for strong men to fight a strong battle. If not, when the men win the battle, they will give glory to themselves. They will say, our own hand has gotten us victory. If a professor is called into the ministry of God's service, when he comes out, he will say, because of my academic knowledge, and many years I studied in university, that's why God decided to honor me with a call. God will not get the glory. But God will look for a fisherman, a farmer, a trader, a tax collector, somebody that is not recognized among the people and call them so that all glory will be given to God. Because to whom much is forgiven, much more is expected. Because to whom many is forgiven, he say love more. If not for the way God called me, I have many opportunities in my life I would have disengaged from the ministry. Especially when I had no support when running the mission for at least 10 years without a single support from anybody. Going not that I was rich, going to work every day and do many a job just to sponsor the work of God. I would have given up the call. Not that I was not educated or was not well read or not intelligent enough to pursue my own personal vision. No, I would have given it up around to pursue my own personal ambition. But because I knew where he picked me from, if he has not called me, I would have as well been dead and forgotten by now. Then it is either God or nothing else. It is either I serve him or I die. And that is the reason why my service to God cannot be compromised for the benefit of the world. Nor for the gold thereof, nor for the silver, nor for the riches, nor for the glory. I serve God because God is God. I don't serve God because of any benefit I want from him. If he decides to bless me, good. If he decides not to, I give him glory. That is because he picked me up when I was nothing. I was the least qualified to be chosen. But he decided to choose the least qualified. That means he's a great God that showed mercy and compassion upon the poor and have mercy on the ignorant. So that is the reason why he is worthy to be praised. God called us to use our gift. He gave every one of us, whether you are called into the ministry or not, God has given us a gift. And what is this gift to be used for? Like the use of electric tools. When we are, when we are plugged in where we fit, the power flows. In our case, as God releases gifts through us to bless the body, in Romans chapter 12, from verse 6 to 8, God called to be different. God makes us understand that we can only grow if we remain permanent in a place where He has chosen us to be. We cannot function in another man's feet. If God called you to be in hand, you cannot function as the head. If God called you to be the feet, you cannot function as the shoulder. If you try to function as the shoulder, you will be out of position. Let's assume you are walking down the street, you see the leg and the shoulder and the shoulder in the hand. It's not, it's not going to work out. Because you cannot walk with your shoulder. So Christians must know their areas and focus on it. Don't let hunger or greed drive you to another man's feet. It will not be well with you if you move to another man's feet. Let's read Romans 12, verse 6 to 
8. 6 to 8 says, If you preach, just preach God's message, nothing else. I read from King James Version. He said, Have you then gift that far according to the grace that is given you? Whether prophecy, let us profess out. And according to the portion of faith, our ministry, let us wait on our ministry. Or he that teaches on teaching. Or he that exhorts on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. And he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So let us wait on our ministry. That is where our blessing is. You cannot be blessed by copying other people's ministry. Other people might have the call to gather stadium. But that is not your gift. Your gift is to pastor them. To tutor them. And lead them to greatness. Stay within that area. God's blessing is in that place. Mama. Your blessing cannot be in another man's feet. You are called to be different from every other person. God did not call you to remain like Job. Or to be like Peter. Or to be like Daniel. God called you to be who you are. Is your name John? God called you to be John. God does not call you to become Peter. Is your name Joro? God called you to be Joro. Remain Joro. Remain in the place He called you to be. From Romans 12, verse 9 to 10, to 13 to, to Romans 13, verse 10. Paul turned his theology into practice and explained in detail all about the godly lifestyle that everyone is called to follow and enjoy and witness now. But what about your own theology? God has given you a call. Do you think the call of God are not relevant to be preached? Do you think the format of discipleship is laid down in your vision? And not what practicing in your ministry? How did the Lord disciple you when you were called? How did God disciple you when you were called? God disciple you by bringing you together, by putting you in the place He wants you to be, by teaching you the doctrine that Christ laid down from the onset. That same principle applied in your ministry. It always works. In CGF, we never had any issue gathering members for the feed of the Lord. Because whenever God called us to disciple a people, we disciple them according to the grace that God has given us. God show us mercy all true. Because we follow the same principle that he laid down for me when he called me. First, what did he teach me? His word. Salvation. Understand the meaning of the word of God. The scripture. Jesus said to the disciples, Say the scripture. In day you think you have life. They are all of them that testifies of me. So when either we want to teach a convert, we start with what we call a book that we call Convert Guide. Which you can also see in our Facebook or our website at cgfnslogin.app. What does this book do? Now you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. That's the primary thing. Thank God. But you need a guide to know how new believers, the authority they have, what the scripture says about Christ. Did Christ actually die for you? Is God real? Are you just called to believe in fantasy? This convert God deal with the whole of that session. That was the same way God teach me. In fact, for three and a half years, I had only one dream. And that was a, a man riding a bicycle, bringing a Bible to me that was very big. And what was written on it, I saw only the 
Jesus bleeding. That was what was in it. For three and a half years, the only thing I know about the scripture was Jesus bleeding. Know the word. Now that I have known the word, the Lord advanced to the next point. Just as we do in our college of ministry. Salvation. We teach salvation. That is the first principle. If you are not a Christian, you must know the fundamental meaning of salvation. Why Christ died for you. Why he died for you according to the scripture. Why he was buried according to the scripture. And rose again the third day according to the scripture. You must have your faith stand on this doctrine. That was how he taught me. That's how I teach my comfort. Then the next is simple. Faith. Without faith, your belief is useless. He that come to God must believe that God is God. And he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Your faith comes dead. And that is what we do in our school of discipleship. Because the Bible says faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. We teach you discipleship because we want you to have faith in God. And when we are done with discipleship, just like when he was done with teaching me faith, he took me further to teach me something else that was unique. That was love. That is, without love, you cannot save other. Because love covers a multitude of sin. And when he taught me love, what does that refer me to? That's why we teach mission. We teach mission. Mission and evangelism. These fall under the class of love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. For we so loved others, we gave ourselves to save them. Love. And when God was done with love and teaching me this basic principle, he graduated me to leadership. When I climbed the rock, having only Bible as my guide, without money, without bag, without anything. And I said, I am a missionary. And in this work, I hope to live and to that leadership, which is the former and the ultimate conclusion of the school of mission. This is all we teach in the mission school. And this is what God taught me in Figo when he called me. And so also, we teach this in detail to every student that are called into the mission field. Why did I take my time to explain this detail? Because we must understand that when God gave you a gift, he did not give it for you to serve yourself. These gifts are to serve his purpose. Remember the call he called me, find out the people that are out. Is it possible for one man to find the whole people on earth? No. He wanted me to raise a movement of people that would join me to find the people and prepare them for the end time and for his return to gather the church together. That was his purpose, and that was his call. But I didn't understand it as then. But as I began to master those desires, those teachings he gave me, all the vision became clearer. Now I no longer ask God, how do I find them out? I know how to find them out. All I need now is the resource to find the people. And God gradually will bless us with the resource we needed to find these people. In Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 13 to 13, verse 10, Paul returned the theologies into practice. So you must also learn to turn this theology of your call into your ministry. Minister within your call. That's why CDF, we never go backward. You lock us in prison, we will speak from the prison. Lock us into hell, we will speak from hell. Because 
we minister within the theology that God gives us. So the resource within God's provision is limitless. I will not say because other pastor can preach John's and pray in the church that I have to do what they do. No, because that is not the areas of my calling. I was called a missionary and this is where I hope to begin my life and end it. Not in another feed. I cannot be in another man's house. Nor will I eat other people's bread for nothing. Yes, I could preach. I could pastor a church. All these are because the missions entails all of it. That does not give me the room tomorrow to build a big church and start using the mission to convert people to it. Though there is nothing with running a church, we run a fellowship. What is the difference? But God has not called me into pastoral work. And if I try to do it, I will be like a fish swimming on top of the water. Because that is not my area of expertise. So learn as a Christian to stay within the place of your vision. Within the place that God called you. So that you can enjoy and witness as a believer. So that you can serve as God's choosing servant. God has a plan for you. He wants you to be that disciple that he has chosen for himself. And made perfect according to his work. The call and the, re- the call and the foreknowledge of God are without repentance. In verses to eight, we already read that having this gift are differ according to the grace that God has given us. God has said in verse six that whether you have the gift of prophecy, you should prophesy. And if you have the gift of Given grace, you should give it. If you have the grace to help others, just help people without asking question. If you have the ability to teach, teach. Stick to it. Don't leave teaching because teachers don't pay nowadays. You take more, you pay more to preach. So I will not teach. I will rather preach. Stay within your teaching. God has given you. I remember when God called me into a church in the jungle. And I saw in the church, very big and mighty church. After walking days in the forest, I saw only four people in the church. I was disappointed. I said, God, this big church. Only four people. And the Lord said to me, start the word. Preach it. Be instant in season and out of season. Preach the word. And I want to say the same thing to you, teachers. Teach the word. The Lord says, teach the word. Don't say people are not many. Don't say there are no people in the church. If it is only the seed, preach the word. Then I pick up my Bible. As I begin to preach the word, the Lord begins to bring people that will listen. And the same thing God is saying to you today, it doesn't matter whether you get to Sunday church on Sunday, it is only you and your family in the church. As long as you are sure that God called you to be a bishop over his house, preach the word. Preach to your family. Disciple your family and re-disciple them again. No knowledge inculcated into another believer that is ever wasted. Because faith comes by hearing. And hearing can only come from the word of God. And God is expecting you today to do the same thing. Are you called to prophesy? Stay within your prophecy. Prophesy. Don't say prophecy doesn't pay nowadays as long as you're under a pastor. Let me go and open a prophetic ministry. What of if it comes time for the people to be disciples? You and I know that you as, as a prophet, you have no ability to disciple people. You can only tell them what their problem is. Are you going to keep telling people what they want to hear every Sunday? What happened if God refused to speak for like two years because there is nothing to speak about in the church? Are you going to formulate your own message? 
Why not stay in the place that God called you and do the work successfully? Use it to grow God's house and you will be blessed by it. Before we go further, I want us to understand something. That Christianity is not meant to be difficult. But if you can't mockery in the sight of God, you will only suffer love. Because God is not mock concerning his promise. Now, the, this topic is something that many Christians have wrestled with for years. And that's what we are going to teach about in this, this principle. Today we are going to be looking at how does God call people? How does God call? There are six principles and four concerning God and two concerning you. God is always at work in the world. God is always calling people. In every generation, God always has a man that he speaks with and call. It was like that in Israel. It's like that in every nation. God has always had people he called and he chose for his purpose. Nothing happened on earth. We saw in the book of Daniel, even to the extent of the Satan super kingdom, when devil, supreme ruler, ruled over the earth, that God predicted their reign and their end. In fact, he shortened their days according to his desire. So we knew that God always at work in the world. God is pursuing a love relationship with you, which is real and is personal. God is not pursuing a love relationship with some distant figure. He is pursuing it with man. Because remember how man was created. God, after creating all the animals and the beasts and all the forests, animals have souls like men. They have flesh. They have bone. God would have as well said, let us make animals like us. But God did not say that. But when it comes to man, he raised all of them from the dust. But when, when it comes to making man, God said, let us make man. Let him have an image like us. And beyond that, let him have dominion. Let him have dominion over the bears, over the fish, over everything that creeps upon the earth. He should have dominion over them. So that relationship sits down today. And beyond that, we are told in Genesis how far God, how the relationship between God and man dated back before the fall of man. The relationship did not start after the fall. It started before the fall of man. In Genesis, at the call of the evening, God was always coming to the garden. What was he coming to do? To have fellowship with man. His meek. His creature. God was there. That was even when he came, he discovered that man felt. God was always there to meet them and have fellowship with them, to have heart to heart discussion with man who was his creature. God is pursuing that same love relationship with you today and it's real and it's personal. He's always speaking. But the question is, are you listening? God speaks to you by the Holy Spirit through the Bible. Prayer, circumstances, the church to reveal himself in his purpose, even most importantly through his word. Through his word, he always speaks. And even today, he is speaking to only those who care to listen and his way. But there are circumstances preventing us from hearing the word of God. In 2 Corinthians, we are told that no man can know the things of man and say the spirit of man that is in him. Just as no man can know the things of God and say the spirit of God that is in God. But how then do we know the things that are freely given us of God? Is by our spirits. Spirit can understand spirit. And we know we did not receive the spirit of the flesh. But we receive the spirit of sonship that cried, Abba, Father. And when the spirit cried, Abba, Father, the spirit himself testified 
that we are the children of God. Therefore, with our spirit, bearing weakness with the spirit of God, we can understand the things that are freely given us of God. It is only he that is born of the spirit that can know the things of God. No more that Jesus said, a certain man be born of water and of the spirit of God. He can by no means see the kingdom of God, neither can he hear it. If you want to hear the things of God, you must be born of the spirit of God. You must, the Adamic nature must first be purged out by baptism on water. Then the Spirit of God can take preeminent control over you, your spirit. And you can hear God directly as when a man speaks with his brother. His purpose and his will. One day God invites you to join him. In what he is already doing in the world, that is what we call call. God is not calling you because he just called out from the window of heaven. Say, God, God. No. God is inviting you to join his creation, to finish his purpose. What was his purpose in Genesis? To bring man back, man who fall for him, so that the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the son. That is his purpose. Every call of God in Genesis has gone in that direction. From the call of Abraham down to David, down to Jesus. Focus on only one thing. Bringing man back to God. If your call does not fit that purpose, <laughs> I wonder which call you have. Your call is to bring man back to God. When he called me, he told me to find the people that are on earth. Does it mean that everybody on earth are not his property? Yes, they are. But his people, God has put a mark on his people. He wants me to bring them to him, into his food, so that they can be prepared, disciples, to meet with the Lord. And this job is not for one man. The Lord encouraged me that as many I remember when I cried to God in my first mission, and I said, Lord, I finished the work you sent to me. Now time has come to go home. The Lord said, no, you must carry them in your hand. You must disciple them until they are also able to bring other people the same way you bring them. That is when your work is finished. And those people must, that you train must be able to train others. Prepare them for the gospel. That is his purpose. When God called you, he did not call you so that you can just share some pamphlets in your streets and say, God, I have done the work. No. If you share 10 million pamphlets and nobody was converted, you have no more a single soul. But God expects those converts to be tutored, to be discipled, so that on the last day, when you go to heaven, you will not only walk before the golden lampstand, you will have the soul and say, God, I raised this one. This is my comfort from the world. I save him and I bring him to heaven. And there will be crown, stars in your crown on that day. And the number of stars is going to be according to the number of converts you present to God. The call of God is never for you to do what you can do. However good, it is always to become involved in his ongoing work. God is not calling you to do the impossible. He's not calling you to do a new work. God is calling you to join an ongoing work. So don't always say, God called me differently. No, God does not call anyone differently. God called all of us together. And we are working in the same feed. And the feed is preserving them in Christ. Presenting them perfect in Christ. That is the call. Every believer will say it. Except your call is different from this. If your call is not to present people perfect in Christ, I wonder where you get it from. It's obviously not from my God. Neither are the means of the world the call of God. People need help. They need salvation. They need healing. They need deliverance. But these are not his call. These are services. Oh, people need money. Oh God, just give me money to give to the offer. I cannot be in the mission field when the, the poor are crying around me. Yes, 
you have to be there because that is not the call. The means of the poor will be met according to as God provides for you. But that is not the call. The call of God is to present them perfect in Christ. Present the people perfect in Christ. When you are able to present the perfect, the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added. Until you are able to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, those blessings you are crying for can never be added to those people. They are only the opportunity of today. They are not for tomorrow. God's invitation for you to walk with him always leads to crisis of belief that require faith and action. Satan often contests the call of God. So you must study to show yourself approved unto God. As a workman that needed not to be ashamed, but rightfully dividing the word of truth. Ask him, did God really say? That was what Satan always do. Throughout your ministry, Satan is going to contend with your call. That's why you must spend time, even if you are called, to understand the call of God. To understand what God actually says and what his teachings are. So that when Satan asks you, did God really say you can give him an answer? To join God in his work, you will have to make major adjustments in your life and family and career. So things you think are perfect for you may not all go. You may have to let you have to let some people down. You have to let yourself down in some cases. How does it happen? Abraham, Moses, Gideon, Samuel, Jeremiah, Amos all heard the voice of God. Me, colleagues, heard the voice of God. Joshua, Saul, David, Elisha, the seven, in Acts chapter 6, 3 to 6, Timothy, we are called by God through prophets and let Jesus appears to the disciple and even to Paul. These were all called to become an apostle of God. God called women too. Deborah, Esther, God called all. Says God called does not differentiate. In fact, about 75% of missionaries are ladies. The countries like the Philippines, many church leaders are ladies. What can they do? Although church has different view about Bible record, that Deborah was a prophet and led Israel and even judged the whole nation in Judges 4, in Judges 4 and 5. Ruth was an ancestor of Jesus. Huda prophesied to priests and leaders. 2 Kings 22 verse 14. Esther saved the entire nation. The daughter of Nun, the daughters of Nobat, 27 verse 3 to 6, inherited equally with the, men, the daughters of Judah. In Nobat 27 verse 3 to 6, inherited equally when men were absent. Philip, prophetic daughters. Acts chapter 21 verse 9. Dorcas did good work for the poor. Acts 9 verse 36. Mary Magdalene was the first to see the risen Lord. John 20 verse 17. Junia was regardless of many church fathers as a woman and an apostle. Phoebus an apostatus, a helper of many and a woman for others, a position of considerable scriptural authority. Nepha had church in her house. Chloe had people who reported to Paul. Priscilla, Rufus, Mothers, Luz, Eunice, Afia are fellow workers in the gospel. Romans 16 verse 1, Colossians 4 verse 15, Corinthians 1 verse 11, 2 Timothy 1 verse 5, Philemon verse 
2, chapter 2. All these women walked in the field. So God is calling men and women. Because he said, on the last day, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will drink dreams. Your young men will see vision. In fact, upon all flesh, God is still pouring the spirit today. Brethren, God is pouring the spirit upon the church. Will you walk with him? Or are you waiting for some people to guide or to direct you on when to trust God or if not to? Brethren, today is the appointed time. Tomorrow might be too late. Today is the day of salvation. God is still speaking today. But then this is where we conclude today's teaching on God's call, which is under our leadership training. God bless you as you participate. We would like to see you by next week, Tuesday, by the same time, 7 p.m. Swedish time and 8 p.m. Nigeria time. And this will help you to be able to participate in our mission training where you learn the truths about the scriptures and grows with it. Brethren, before we pray, I just want you to use this opportunity to refresh upon your life. Have you ever been wondering in your life, does God see speak today? How come he's not speaking to me? But then after this message this night, challenge God, God will speak to you, either through his word or directly through a voice or through visions, through revelation, through trust. God will speak. God is still speaking. In fact, God will guide you. But one thing you must know as Christian, God does not speak when there is nothing to be said. God speaks to you when he sees that your path is straying from him. He wants to guide you back to his footstep. Or when he's directly giving you an assignment or a mandate, he also speaks. And when you do something that pleases him, he also speaks. God is always speaking with you. So let us pray. Father Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your word that has come forth. Amen. Thank you for speaking to me and making me understand the call you called me. Thank you for speaking to the apostle. Thank you for speaking to the church today. Thank you for speaking to the missionaries. Thank you for speaking in every heart I and mean, in every district, in every church, in every missionary district, in every fellowship today. Lord, speak to our hearts. Speak to our soul. Lead us, O oh Lord, in the path that you alone have chosen. Be the leader and your word. Father, Lord, send your word to as many that are sick tonight and heal them from their disease. As many that are in captivity, send your word and liberate them. Send your word. Your word can still free people to live. Your word can still heal many. Your word can still raise the dead. Your word can still save the souls of the lost. Lord, your word, in fact, is saving life right now. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We exalt your name above all the heaven. O oh Lord, be thou glorified. Be magnified, O oh Lord, our God, above all the earth. For in Jesus' name we pray. Brethren, if you miss any of our topic, you can still go to cgfnslogin.app and check for any of the video you missed or teachings you missed in our website. Or you can go to Facebook at CGF Open House Fellowship and you will be able to register and you will not miss any of our program. God bless you as you take part of this program. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.